sun I'm Ryan Benton, and I've been living with muscular dystrophy my entire life. Oh, I've seen fools wait. See you, man. Good to see you. It was a trip. It was actually really good. Nowhere in time. I knew Ryan's parents from when I was in grade school. I grew up three blocks from his dad and about a half a mile from his mom. I'm in town. I'm actually going to go over to talk to Ryan. Are you coming over? Oh, cool. Okay, good. Let's see if we can get in this way. I'm not sure. It's nice. People wave at you. <laughs> Doesn't happen too many other places. It'll be on the west side because it's an odd number. So I do you remember that much. There it is right there. How's it going? Hey, Kurt. Good. How are you doing? Doing well. I guess it's you. <laughs> <laughs> how you doing, buddy? You were looking good. Thanks, man. Really how are you? I recognized you. How you been? Good. Good. Great. Hey, hey Sandra, how are you? Hello, how are you? Good. Are you being filmed by the Yeah. <laughs> well, I see a red light! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you too. You too. When Ryan was around three years old, we had quite a few friends that had children around Ryan's age, and they would be running and playing and um, it just seemed like Ryan wasn't keeping up with them in the physical activities. A friend of ours was over for a barbecue and he was a orthopedic surgeon and he, he recognized something in the way Ryan stood up. He said, well, that's a classic symptom of muscular dystrophy and at that point we decided to go ahead and have him checked out and they did confirm it later. It's a pretty normal re regression, I should say. He kind of followed the same steps, walking, falling, hard to get up. I remember sixth and seventh grade really struggling walking and using walls to brace myself and just being very conscientious of not being knocked down. He probably was in leg braces by around eight, uh, part-time wheelchair around 10 for long distances, and um, was probably full-time wheelchair at the age of 12. When I first met Ryan in middle school, he could still walk. He had struggles, but he was still able to walk a little bit. And over the course of uh, you know my uh, 10 years of knowing him, he's just slowly degenerated. And it's just a, an odd, um, terrible thing to see somebody that you've known and you have memories with being able to do things. And now they're, they're not able to do things that they once could. From a young age, you're very aware of your mortality and your you're very aware of a uh, timeline between 24 to 30 that you kind of are aware that that's a life expectancy. When he was about 16, he started developing severe scoliosis. He had about a 90 degree curvature of the spine and at that point we had the uh, steel rods placed in his back. And a year later they broke and they had to go in and redo it again. Most kids die of the disease between the ages of about 17 to 24. Since your heart is a muscle also, usually they die of heart failure or pneumonia because they can't clear their lungs well enough. He had lost a lot of weight. He was down to uh, just over 70 pounds. And, um, you know, it, it was to the point where it, it, if nothing happened anytime soon, uh, he, he was at a critical point. There were different um, things going on, research studies, that gave us hope, but every research study that was out there that we would hear about, 
and there would always be kind of a dead end to, to it. As he progressed into his teenage years and early adulthood, there still wasn't ever anything positive as far as any kind of treatment goes. It's hard because when you're a kid, you ask your parents, you know, well, how can I get better, you know? Or when's this gonna be cured because you're, you're doing these telethons and you're doing these fundraisers to raise money for a cure and you're like, well, when's this cure gonna happen? I was had in the back of my mind to in some way help him out, you know. At the time, all we could do were the, the telephones and things like that. And fast forward 18, 19 years and we're working with stem cells. This is our building here. We had a case of Becker's muscular dystrophy who came in and was treated in Costa Rica. This guy was 38 years old and he was, you know, bent over and was using a four-pronged cane to get around. And three months after the treatment, he came back caneless and walking upright. I was very impressed with the result. And so then I contacted uh, Ryan's family to see if they were, you know, at all interested in doing this. And that's, that, that's how it all got started. He said, you know, I can't promise anything, but, you know, this is an option that I, I is working for a lot of other people with other diseases. And I think that you're to the age now where it's like, let's try something because time isn't really on your side right now. As parents, you want to do everything possible for your, for your children. And, and we knew we had no alternatives. There was, there was no treatment available in the United States. And uh, we had to do something. We had no idea what stem cells were. Had, did, didn't realize there's a difference between um, adult stem cells and embryonic stem cells and, and you know we were just as stupid about the whole process as anybody else and he uh, provided some materials for us we educated ourselves on stem cells. The rationale is that the MSCs when you inject them into muscle they stay in the muscle number one. Number two we know that they're not immediately rejected by the immune system they're actually anti-inflammatory and they calm down the immune system. We also weren't going to do anything that was dangerous or could harm him in any way and Neil was very confident that we had nothing to worry about. He had treated numerous patients without any side effects whatsoever. We figured at that point the worst thing that could happen to Ryan would be nothing. That would be the worst thing. So we decided, all of us, Ryan, uh, his dad, Sandra and I, uh, that this was the right thing to do. This could be something that could possibly help a lot of other people. And so it was very exciting to carry that on my shoulder and, and hope the best um, for not only me, but that this could do something amazing with MD. When I got there, they do about 60 to 70 intermuscular injections in each major muscle group. So they did the, the shoulders, the arms, the legs, and the neck, and just pumped me full of stem cells. It was about a week to 10 days after his first treatment that he started noticing things. First of all, in my weight, I gained about 20, 25 pounds, and uh, which I had been at about you know, 60, 70 pounds my entire life, and now I'm over 100. And I just started noticing a big increase in muscle during my workouts. For the first time in his life, he was stiff the next day and he had soreness in his muscles. And he said, Dad, this is different. I've never experienced this before. So we knew something was going on. Endurance and range of motion and, and just physical strength, it's amazing. I mean, I've never felt something like this before. Up until the time he was treated, there, were, there would be times that we would be in the van and if we took off too fast, his head would fall back and he couldn't pull it back up. Ten days after his first treatment, the same thing happened and he was able to pull his head up. And it was, it was kind of like a, you know, a moment that you know, we'll never forget. He, uh, it was fantastic and uh, he just got stronger from there. When you set him up on the side of the bed like this, uh, normally he'd just fall over, but now he can sit there without falling over his because his trunk strength is much, much, much stronger. So, and his balance is, is much better. So there are, you know, people 
it's so hard to think about those subtle changes, but for Ryan, they're huge. When we first talked about him getting treated, which was more than two and a half years ago, um, they said he had about two and a half years left, and they based that on you know the, the amount of atrophy and particularly the lung function tests and things like that. His lung function tests actually improved after he was treated. They didn't go to normal, but they significantly improved. You know, here we are more than two and a half years later, and he's actually in much better shape than he was prior to getting treated. I can't stress enough to say how fortunate Ryan's life has been. You know, he has a terrible disease, but yet he, he has been, he's a very fortunate kid. I mean, there are a lot of kids that have muscular dystrophy that would love to do what he does. He lives on, he's lived on his own since he was 18. Clint is, is his attendant. They live out in a place where they're doing things, you know, just like every other kid does. He's just in a wheelchair, you know, he's in a band, he plays organ, he sings, he writes songs. He's a very fortunate kid. He had a lot of benefit for about the first three months and then the benefit started wearing off. And the reason for that is these cells don't last forever in the body. There's a chance if he were to get, continue to get treatment that he could live quite a normal lifespan. It would be ideal if I could get every three months get a set of treatments and who knows how, how much stronger I could keep getting. We want other people to have access to those treatments. And we want Ryan to continue to have the treatments. He's only had three treatments. You know, he had three in a, in a matter of a year, and that last one was over a year ago. We would like to get him treated again soon because we see the benefit, and it's almost immediate. And uh, it's real frustrating that he can't be treated once a month or, you know, as, as often as needed to get him to where he needs to be. in Panama Sunday evening about 9 o'clock. We got the list, the itinerary for the week, and um, in the morning the van was there for us. This clinic just has kind of a very relaxed feel to it and very professional at the same time, so it's comforting in that sense. <laughs> if we get there. Go ahead. Okay. Hello, how are you? Hey, y'all. The main, main doctor. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. How are you guys? Good. Hey, what's up? What are you doing in here? Hey. Right, I got uh, first day of blood work, three days of intermuscular injections, and the last day was an IV. And, um... <laughs> You're good? Yeah, I'm great, yeah. How did those uh, treat you, right? It, was, it went pretty smooth. Panama's got a great staff here, uh, very professional, very just in and out and no BS. They have everything ready and prepared. Um, they're very knowledgeable in everything that they're doing and, and uh, just overall very great experience. Well, thank okay. you, doctor. You, did a, very, you, you did a very good job. Okay. Very smooth. All right. I think the thing, too, that um, meant a lot was everybody in the clinic just really loves being there and you can tell they legitimately care about the people, the patients. You guys are very young here, not in a bad way. What I find to be the most inspiring coming here is that everybody here is here to make their life and live their life to the fullest. You don't meet a patient that comes here that doesn't care about their health and doesn't really want to get the most out of life and stem cell therapy is still in the experimental phase and it's still new and so to take this journey on that sort of hope and risk it's I, I find it to be inspiring because you know there's no certainty on the outcome but you know everybody here is very hopeful and there's a lot of hope going around right and then even having said that there's been no negative effects from anybody that I've talked to from these treatments I mean, everything uh, is positive about it. This therapy is very real, and it's not going away, and it's not something that needs to be taken lightly because 
this is the way of the future when it comes to medicine. What is so frustrating about this situation is that we have to come to Panama to, to do this. You're taking all natural cells, something from your body, and re-injecting them, and they help cure, in Ryan's case, a neuromuscular disease, which is unheard of. Ryan, you want to you get to iPod ready? You want yours or mine? I'll take mine. You want the muffs? Sure. I really believe that there's people you meet, and there's people you meet for a reason. And there's a very concrete reason why I've met Clint because it's hard for me just to give credit for stem cell therapy for me being where I am because Clint deserves just as much credit because he's really helped me to this point in my life. And there's not a lot of people that get someone like that in their lives. Well, I don't... He's gonna be very modest. I just feel like uh... I'm just a guy and he's just a guy. We're just living life and we, we have similar interests. We love life and we pursue life to the fullest and it makes sense for us to be friends and the fact that he's in a wheelchair is irrelevant. When Ryan was first diagnosed, they told us that they would probably have a cure within his lifetime. And I remember Ryan said, he was about 18 or 19, he goes, Dad, you told me they'd have a cure. And it broke my heart. You know, how do you, how do you answer that? But uh, it's happened now, so we're thrilled. We don't get to redo our lives. So I want this life that I have to be to the fullest and I want you know, I, I'm not opposed to dreaming big, like walking isn't out of the question and it's not something that I uh, am embarrassed to say that I'd like to do someday and you know, I'm going to keep doing this therapy until that happens and keep working out and keep, keep pushing. Um.